Good morning, let's stand to our feet. So happy you came to Canton Church and worship with us. My name's Wentz. I encourage you to sing your songs. Let's lift praise to God today. Lift your voice. Sing this together. Water, you turn into wine. Lift it up. Water, you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Darkness is shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. You say that I got. I got is greater. I got is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. I got is healer. Awesome. Power of God, of God. Come on, put your hands together. Into the darkness you shine. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. We believe there's none like you.
situation. Believe it, I lift my eyes. I lift my eyes up. My help comes from the Lord. We look to you, Lord Jesus, we lift our eyes and say, I lift so much. We're thankful that you're there for us always, God, and that your love for us never changes. It never ends, God.
weekend all over this country, friends and family and loved ones, they're going to gather together around barbecues. They're going to throw steaks and ribs and hamburgers on the grill, and together they're going to celebrate our freedom as a nation. This day set aside to mark when our forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence to declare that we were no longer under slavery of Great Britain. See, it wasn't just the signing of a document that initiated our freedom. And after that, soldiers went out to the battlefield and they bled and died so that you and I can call ourselves free. And that's what we celebrate this weekend. But for those of us who call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, who he lives in our heart, we know that in this place this morning, we celebrate an even greater freedom than that of freedom from Great Britain. We celebrate the freedom that Luke wrote about in his gospel in the first chapter when Zechariah praises God and he said, let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to help his people and has given them freedom. He has given us a powerful savior from the family 
of God's servant, David. You and I know that Jesus Christ fought a different kind of battle. He stepped up. It's the one and only son of God. He went forward to the cross and he bled and died so that you and I could be free. But not so that we could gather around a barbecue, eat hamburgers and watch fireworks. He died so that we could be free from sin and death and hell and the grave and sickness and disease. That's what Jesus came to deliver his people from. And that is the freedom that you and I stand and proclaim in this place, this morning, and each and every time that we gather together. So I want to encourage you, as we continue to worship today, let's continue to celebrate that freedom that was purchased for us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. We thank you for sending your son Jesus, Lord, and that he bled and died upon the cross, that you loved us so much you sent your one and only son to die in our place as the sacrificial lamb of God so that we could be free. Lord, we invite you into this place with us this morning, and we ask that you would inhabit our praises. Be here with us in this place. Cause your Holy Spirit to fall down upon us and move in our hearts in such a way that we would not leave here the same way that we walked in, but that we would leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Let's continue worshiping together.
praise before he sacrifices. We give him praise this morning. Come on, lift it up. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at Kent Church. Before you're seated, high five somebody, shake their hand, and tell them I'm so glad you're at Kent Church this morning. Christ-centered life. And if it's your first, second, or third time to be with us, we're so glad that you came out to, to check us out, to see who we are, to see what we're about. We're so glad you're here this morning. If you would, if you're first, second, or third time visitor, we would love for you to take the connection card that's located either, either in your seat when you came in or located in the seat back in front of you. Take that card, fill it out, and then at the end of service, when we conclude, take that to the information center located in the lobby. And if it's your first time, you get one of these really cool Canton Church cups when you do that. If it's your second time, you get a really cool charging stick. You take this with you after you charge it. It'll charge your cell phone. It's really cool how that works. And if it's your third time, you get a really cool Canton Church t-shirt. They're soft. They're comfortable. You want to make sure you come three times so that you can get one of these really cool shirts. But hey, tomorrow, if you haven't heard, it's July 4th. Spoiler alert, tomorrow we celebrate Independence Day. Movies will be on that are awesome and like bombs are going off on TNT all day long tomorrow. It's great. But tomorrow night, the city of Canton is doing a really, really cool fireworks show. They do it every year. It's phenomenal. And where we sit, this building, the parking lot surrounding this building is a phenomenal spot to watch those fireworks from. You can see them very clearly, very well. And this parking lot fills up with hundreds of people from this community that have never come through the doors of Canton Church. And so what we as a church are doing is we are going to show up and we are going to just serve the people of our community. We're going to give away a ton of Cokes. We're going to give away a ton of waters. We're going to give away 500 hot dogs. We're giving away a grill. It's going to be an awesome time. But what we need is we need you to come and we need you to serve the people of our community. We need help giving out hot dogs. We need help cooking hot dogs. We need help walking waters around the parking lot and handing those out to people that are hot. But we would love for you to come and to be a part of that team. But you can sign up to do so at the Information Center. Very old school sign up. You just write your name on a piece of paper. It's very easy. We would love for you to be a part of that. Another serving opportunity, if you have not heard, on August the 7th, we are going as a church to three services. If you look around this room, this room's pretty full right now. And we want to always create space for people to come in to experience God in a real way in a tangible way and to do so we've got to create more room but in order for us to create more room we need more volunteers so right now we have two services and two teams of volunteers and if you've never served on a serving team if you've been with us for a while and you've never jumped on or you've only been with us a couple of weeks and want to connect and plug in in a deeper way we would love for you to connect to one of our serving teams there's a, a serve or can serve Text that code word to that phone number, and we will get in touch with you to get you a part of one of our amazing, amazing serving teams. Another really cool thing coming up in July, July the 15th through the 17th, we have our Vacation Bible School. Our VBS this year is called Pets Unleashed. It's going to be a blast. There's going to be animals here. It's going to be crazy. Your kid wants to be a part of VBS this year. Sign them up at Canton Church. Dot com. But today, our children's pastor and our group pastor, Pastor Blake Knapp, is coming to speak to us. He's continuing our series, Things We Wish Jesus Didn't Say. I heard it in the first service. It's really good. I'm excited that you get to hear it this morning. But we're so glad you came out this morning.
Good morning, Canton Church. How's everybody doing today? Happy 4th of July weekend. I'm so glad that you, that you guys are here as we prepare to celebrate our independence. It's always an exciting weekend, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting to share God's Word with you this morning. If you've got your Bible or um, your app, you can go ahead and turn or swipe with me to Luke chapter 12, and um, we're going we're gonna to start off uh, with verse 49 in a moment as kind of our launching point. Um, but while you're turning there, uh, set the stage a little bit. It was 1986. I was five years old. And Ronald Reagan was president. It was a great time period of my life. It was a great time period in the history of America. It was at this time that showbiz pizza was all the rage. Right, some of you are laughing because you remember going to Showbiz Pizza. Maybe some younger folks in the room are like, what in the world? Well, Showbiz Pizza was Chuck E. Cheese before Chuck E. Cheese was Chuck E. Cheese. All right? And now when you go to Chuck E. Cheese, there's like some, there's some shoddy little arcade games over in the corner. And like their pizza really hasn't improved much and everything. And, and, but there's a show, but it's all like digital. It's on a screen. And it's, it's really, really lame. See... Before Chuck E. Cheese became what it is today, we had showbiz, and showbiz had, like, sea level animatronics. All right? Like, not Disney quality. Like, they were even, like, a couple notches down. But, but by golly, we had them, and we loved it. And so you could, you could go to showbiz pizza place, and you could eat mediocre pizza... And you could roll ski ball until your arm fell off. And you could exchange your tickets for some penny prizes. And then you could go out into the, into the, the auditorium. And every 15 minutes or so, there would be a, a show where these animatronics would come to life. The curtains would open. And, and right over here, the, the mainstay, the figurehead of Showbiz Pizza was Billy Bob. All right, He was this, this country bear. He had like one tooth. And he wore overalls with one strap. And they were like red and yellow striped. And he would, he would come out and he would like plinkety plunk on the guitar. And he would sing country songs and everything. And then, then next to him... I don't even know like, why this guy was a part of the band. He was like a wolf dressed up as a magician in like a red sequin tuxedo. And he had this creepy puppet because we all know that's what kids like is creepy puppets. <laughs> and he would do like this ventriloquism act. Or, I, I don't know. Like, I, it sounds weird because it was weird. But we loved it. We let, and then right here next to that dude, it was like a polar bear in a Hawaiian shirt sitting on a surfboard that would like rock back and forth, and he would play the electric guitar. I don't even know what that's about. Then over here on this side, like it started out as like a girl mouse, <laughs> but then randomly, like a couple years later, it transitioned to a chicken, and she was a cheerleader, and she had these pom-poms, and she didn't play any instruments. She just sat there and like, would just lean back and forth and just twirl her pom-poms. I don't know. Like they had a sign-up sheet, like for the band. Who wants to join the band? And she just walked up and they signed her up, you know. And then over here on this side was the pasta chef. And he was, he was this Italian guy. He looked kind of like Phil Ropo, only he had hair. <laughs> and his name was Pasquale. And the only thing that I know about Pasquale is that when Pasquale says polka, you stop what you're doing and dance. That was like his song. It was like the big thing. He had this little critter that would like come up out of a trash can next to him and like play the accordion. I, I don't, it was, it was weird, dude. It was weird. But my favorite character of all was right here in the middle. And he was the biggest character of them. I mean, like he was, he was large and in charge right up in front. He played the Hammond B3 organ. Well, not really. He just kind of did this. But they made it sound like he could play it. And his name was Munch. And he was a humongous gorilla. 
And he was all, I loved Munch. Munch was my favorite. And I can remember at the age of five, I had like a Voltron-themed birthday party at Showbiz Pizza Place. And I remember we had reserved like the table like right here in the center you know, because everybody that was somebody had their birthday party at Showbiz Pizza Place. And if you were the creme de la creme, the elite of the elite, you got the center table. And buddy, I had it. And I can remember we were down there, we were eating pizza, and I was opening up presents and everything. And all of a sudden, the Shekinah glory from heaven opened up, and those curtains rolled back. And Munch gave him the count, and Billy Bob started twanging on the guitar. Pasquale was doing his polka over here, and Surfboard Man was wailing on the electric guitar over here. And this dude was swinging his puppet around and making everyone uncomfortable. The cheerleader was twirling those pom poms, and Munch, he began to jam on that organ. And, buddy, all the kids rushed forward, and they started dancing. For a few minutes, heaven was in the air, and we felt it. Surging through our veins. But it was short lived because a few moments later the curtains rolled back together and it was over. And I can remember standing there in the front of that showbiz pizza when one of the greatest dares that I've ever received in my life was issued to me by one of my friends attending my birthday party. They didn't just dare me. They didn't even triple dog dare me, or double dog dare me. They, they skipped all the way to the triple dog dare to go forward and pull back the curtain to look at what was behind there. At first I thought, well, this ain't no big deal. Like, it's, it's Munch and the gang. Like, it's going to be cool. But the closer that I got to that curtain, the more nervous I got in my my heart kind of got up in my throat, and I reached forward to grab hold of it. And by the way, this was something that the establishment kind of frowned upon. So you had to do it like you had to be sneaky about it. So I kind of tiptoed up there, and my hands are trembling. My fingers laid hold of the curtain, and the presence in the room just kind of took my breath. But buddy, I was determined to make it through this rite of passage, and I peeled back that curtain just wide enough for a shaft of light to shine through. And there, in front of me, suspended in animation, was that humongous gorilla named Munch. And when I close my eyes and lay down my head on my pillow every night, he haunts me. <laughs> and I tell you that that was the first and last time that I ever looked behind the curtain at Showbiz Pizza Place. Because sometimes when we look behind the curtain, when that gets peeled back and the truth gets revealed, we don't always like the things that we see. And the same is true with our walk with Jesus Christ. See, here in America especially, we have these ideas of what we think it means to truly follow Jesus. We see, we see Jesus um, riding on a unicorn, and he's this God of, of peace and love and mercy. And then in Orlando, a man walks into a gay and lesbian bar and kills 50 people. And standing out front of the road in the aftermath and the aftershock, on one side of the street, you have a Christ follower, a self-proclaimed Christ follower who's resurrecting or, or um, erecting a, a monument to remember those who have lost their lives and have gone on to heaven. And on the other side of the street, you have self-proclaimed Christ followers who are holding up signs and they're picketing and they're saying, Jesus or, or God sent the shooter. And it's all about his wrath and that those people are going to, they're going to die and they're going to burn and they're going to go to hell. And we're stuck somewhere in the middle left to decide. How do we choose? We find ourselves in this gray area and we're totally unsure of what it means to truly follow Christ here in 2016. And so we go to the scriptures to find some, some relief, to find some hope, to find some comfort. But again, just like at Showbiz Pizza Place, when we peel back that curtain, sometimes we're left with some stuff that's hard for us to handle. We don't always like the things that we see when we go to God's Word. 
And this series is aptly titled, Things We Wish Jesus Didn't Say. Because here in Luke 12, i got to be honest, I really wish Jesus didn't say this. But he did. Starting with verse 49, he says, I came to set fire to the world. And I wish it were already burning. I have a baptism to suffer through and I feel very troubled until it's over. Do you think I came to give peace to the earth? Most of us would say yes. Jesus came to give peace, but in the next breath he says no. I tell you, I came to divide it. From now on, a family with five people will be divided. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And Jesus speaks this, and we find it right here in the truth of the Gospels. And it's kind of thrust in our lap, and we're like, well, now what do we do with this? See, this fire in this passage that he mentions, Jesus is likely, he's referencing not peace and love, he's referencing judgment and wrath that is going to come at the end of days. And this baptism that he speaks of is a foreshadowing of the work that he is going to do on the cross by which and through which all man will be judged. See, the cross here issues each of us a challenge. And by the cross, each one of us must decide where our allegiance lies. Either for Christ or against him. But we struggle with what that really means and what that really looks like and how that gets played out in our life, especially in light of passages like this one. But the challenge of the cross is a simple one. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. As one writer put it, he wrote, the bloodstained cross serves as the vehicle through which true peace will be brought to the world and eternity. But in the meantime, the presence of the cross creates a division which penetrates even the most sacred of relationships, those of our families. And this division may lead to the costly sacrifice of the most treasured of human ties. See, though the message of taking up one's cross seems pretty straightforward, pretty pretty cut and dry, a lot of us, myself included, we've made following Jesus Christ out to be about something that it's not about. We've made it about us. See, following Christ has nothing to do with us at all. Check out this passage from Luke 9. This is what Jesus says again in Luke 9. He says, As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you any place you go. Jesus said to them, The foxes have holes to live in, and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Jesus said to another man, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. You must go and tell about the kingdom of God. Another man said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, anyone who begins to plow a field but keeps looking back is of no use in the kingdom of God. Ouch, right? That's some pretty tough stuff. See, this passage, it lays out the story of three candidates for discipleship. And while each of these approaches, they may have happened at different times throughout Jesus' um, life here on the earth, Luke combines them together in this one story because of their subject matter. And through the stories of these three would-be disciples, we can learn a bit about what following Christ is not. We learn a bit about what following Christ is not. There's three things. Number one, following Christ is not about our comfort. Following Christ is not about our comfort. There at the beginning of that passage, it says, As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you any place you go. And Jesus said to them, The foxes have holes to live in, and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Sarah and I were just at camp this past week. We took um, several elementary school age children from our church and some of their friends, and we went to um, Homer, Georgia. Does anybody know where Homer, Georgia is? 
the people that live in Homer, Georgia don't know where Homer, Georgia is. Like, that's how far out it is. No cell phone service or anything. We're out there suffering for Jesus at this camp um, with these grade school kids. And, and we checked in on Monday afternoon and got all the stuff in our cabins and everything. Sarah's a cabin leader for girls. I'm a cabin leader for boys. And we come together at dinner. And the first thing Sarah says to me at dinner is she says, the bed in my room is awful. And I said, what? We got pillow top sleep numbers in our cabin. Like, I don't know. Like, you must have drawn the short end of the stick. I'm like, what are you thinking? This is camp. This isn't the Ritz Carlton. But yet we've come to, we just have this expectation in our mind that when we're serving Christ, like everything is going to be like the, the topmost level of comfort. Like it's all about us, right? And see, then, then that's, that's only perpetuated by these televangelists who preach this, this prosperity gospel. And they say things like, just name it and claim it. Like, go out to the Mercedes dealership and lay hands on the hood of one of those vehicles and march around it seven times and it'll be yours. Right? Like, it doesn't matter that you work a minimum wage job at McDonald's and you don't have a high school diploma. Like, God wants you to have that stuff, along with a new house and a new wardrobe and a bass boat. God wants you to give Pastor Blake $100 on the way out of church today. Only one of those statements is true. I'm going to leave it up to you to figure that out. <laughs> you just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and what happens, happens. See, the truth of the matter is that Jesus never promised us any of that stuff. Jesus never promised us blessing upon blessing that we would have everything that we could possibly want. But he did say he would take care of our needs. Matthew 6, 25 through 33, Jesus says, So I tell you, don't worry about the food or drink you need to live or about the clothes you need for your body. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. And you know that you are worth much more than the birds. You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. Why do you worry about clothes? Look at how the lilies in the field grow. They don't work or make clothes for themselves, but I tell you that even Solomon, with all of his riches, was not dressed as beautifully as one of these flowers. God clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today, but tomorrow is thrown into the fire. So you can be even more sure that God will clothe you. Don't have so little faith. Don't worry and say, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? The people who don't know God keep trying to get these things. And your Father in heaven knows you need them. So seek first God's kingdom. And what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. This same truth is what Paul wrote about to the church in Philippi in, in Philippians 4.19 when he said, My God will use his wonderful riches in Christ Jesus to give you everything that you need. So following Christ isn't about your comfort, but that requires us to be willing to make some sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. We've got to make some sacrifices because it's not about us. It's not about our comfort. The second thing it's not about is following Christ is not about our timetable. It's not about our timetable. Right there in the middle of that passage we read earlier, Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. You must go and tell about the kingdom of God. See, Jesus was talking here to a Jewish man. This was the culture in which he lived. And for a Jew, proper burial of one's loved ones was paramount. It was of utmost importance. And this duty of proper burial, it would have taken precedence over pretty much everything else within the Jewish culture and heritage. It would have taken pre precedence over the study of the law. It would have taken uh, precedence over attending the temple servants service. It would have taken precedent over the killing of the Passover sacrifice. It would have come before the observance of circumcision, and it would have been placed um, ahead of the reading of the Megillah, which was a scroll that Jews would read from both um, day and night um, every single day. So based on this, Jesus responds to this man when he wants to go back and bury his father, knowing the Jews hold burial as, as the top priority seems that Jesus, his response is a little bit out of whack. But what we fail to realize is that it was likely the case that this man's father wasn't even dead yet. 
Because had this man's father been dead, this man would have not been where Jesus was. He would have been back with his family. He would have been taking care of the burial and everything. So essentially what this man was saying is, I will follow you, Jesus, but first let me go and live a full and happy life with my family. And then once that is done, then I will come and give myself over to you. And so Jesus' response to him is really, it's, it's an expression of the sense of urgency that surrounds the fulfillment of his mission. To seek and to save that which is lost. He said this to his followers in Luke 10 too. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest Field. Ladies and gentlemen, our time as Christ followers is right now. This is the time. The day is coming soon. Our time is drawing short. Now is the time to follow Christ and to be about his message and his mission. We have to have a sense of urgency on behalf of the gospel because it's not about our comfort. It's not about our timetable. The third thing it's not about, following Christ is not about our desires. It's not about our desires. The third man in that passage that we read earlier, it says, Another man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, Anyone who begins to plow a field but keeps looking back is of no use in the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is addressing here is, is simply he's addressing our focus, the things that we're focused on. See, this man's desire to go back to his family showed that his focus was not on the task at hand, but rather that he was reluctant to fully commit to the cause. And a lot of us, we, we've got it in order, right? Like the things that we're focused on, like I'm going to graduate high school. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a date I'm going to go to college and figure out what I want to do with my life. And I'm going to graduate college and I'm going to secure a good job. And hopefully that date will turn into somebody wanting to marry me and spend the rest of their life with me. I didn't really have trouble with that, but some of you. <laughs> Lance got lucky. <laughs> Pray for Allie. And then we're going to get married and... We're going to have kids and 2.4 to be exact. And we're going to buy a house with a white picket fence. And everything's going to be great about our life. And then maybe we'll get around to following Christ. We're focused on this over here. And we're focused on this over here. And Jesus is saying anyone who starts to plow a field but continues to look over their shoulder is worthless to the kingdom of God. Because any of you that have ever worked on a farm, you know what it takes to plow a field. You've got to have straight rows in order for them to be able to be planted in. We can't look over our shoulder and drive a straight row. So because our focus is over here and our focus is over here, we're trying to plow this field and it's like all over the place, just willy-nilly. And it's worthless. It's kind of like trying to drive a vehicle forward in downtown Atlanta traffic while looking in the rearview mirror. What's going to happen? A big mess. That's what's going to happen. Because it's not about the things that we desire. We can't look to the right and look to the left and focus over here and focus over here. Jesus said, you've got to be about the task at hand, which is winning souls and making disciples. That's what following Christ is all about. Proverbs chapter 4 addresses this. It gives us some, some principles to live by in order to live a life of proper focus. It says this, my father taught me, take my words to heart. Follow my commands and you will live. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. If we're going to truly follow after Christ for our lives, then we have to focus completely upon the advancement of the gospel and nothing else. That's got to take precedent because it's not about our comfort. It's not about our timetable, and it is not about our desires. 
But if it's not about those things, then what is it about? If following Christ is about us taking hold of the abundant life that Jesus talks about in John 10, 10, then how do we do that? When Jesus says a thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I came to give life in all of its fullness, what does that mean? What does that look like for us? And how do we grab hold and live a life of fullness? I hope that when they put me in the grave at the end of my life, that on my tombstone, it would be able to say, he lived a life of fullness. I hope that they would stand around and talk about, man, what a life that guy lived. Completely sold out and surrendered to Jesus Christ. That's what I hope they'll say about me. But what does that look like? See, when we, start to, when we start to unravel this principle in Scripture, we get to another one of Jesus' hard sayings in John chapter 6, 53 through 59, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you must eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. Wait, what? Did, yeah, that's what it says. What it, I tell you the truth, you must eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood. Blood. This is like cannibalistic kind of stuff. Like, people, you should be uncomfortable. Because the hearers that he was speaking to, the, the people that heard him say this, it made them uncomfortable. He continues on and he says, Otherwise, you won't have real life in you. If you don't eat my flesh, if you don't drink my blood, you won't have real life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who 